thank you for you and your family's commitment to Israel and the strength of the Jewish community in North America. It's an honor to be here tonight with you and to see firsthand all the work you've done. When I was elected Prime Minister of Canada, the uh, New York Times did a story which read as follows. By winning the election in Canada and becoming Prime Minister, Mr. Mulroney has become the most famous and influential Mulroney in North America since Irish immigration began <laughs> in 1832. The next day, there was a letter to the editor in the paper from one Patrick O'Malley. And he wrote, Prime Minister Mulroney appears to be a fine young man, and I wish him well. But when you say that he's the most famous and influential Mulroney, I would remind you that in 1923, Edward P. Mulroney was elected chairman of the New York State Liquor Control Board. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, that's a hell of a lot more influential than being Prime Minister of Canada. <laughs> in his book, Explaining Hitler, Ron Rosenbaum tells of Hitler just prior to his suicide, as the Third Reich lay in ruins, calling on Germans to, above all else, continue the struggle against the Jews, the eternal poisoners of the world. Who would have imagined that this call, virtually from the grave, would be heeded more than 80 years later, on an otherwise ordinary Saturday in October, when we witnessed in horror and disbelief the largest single-day murder of Jews since the Holocaust. The most sacred duty of any government is to provide for the security of its citizens. No government could let these obscenities go unpunished and retain the trust of its people. Hamas knew full well the reaction its murderous rampage against innocence would provoke. They knew, and they didn't care. Indeed, it's the reaction they sought. They chose to put the lives of the two million people of Gaza they claimed to defend in mortal danger in a deliberate nihilistic attempt to set the Middle East on fire. But why would they do this? It certainly wasn't to increase the likelihood of a Palestinian state. It was not to improve the lives of the people of Gaza. So why? Well, because these are terrorists in the purest sense of the word, for whom the senseless violent, violence act satisfies the strategic objective, which is very simple, killing Jews. You know, you can ride a bike around that if you want, but there's one answer, one objective, one fit of lunacy, collective lunacy, killing Jews. Hamas knew something else. They knew they could count on a legion of apologists who, while decrying attacks on Jews here at home, are prepared to accept attacks on Jews in Israel as deserved. Contemporary anti-Semitism has added the state of Israel to its list of targets. Israel has become the new Jew. Stripped of its intellectual pretensions of the cloak of human rights, these ritual denunciations of Israel, with which we have become all too familiar, are a pernicious form of racism. I don't believe in collective guilt or collective responsibility. Only the killers in the organization they serve are really guilty of these atrocities. Their women and children are not. And yet, Hamas is using them to pay the price while they scurry about safely in tunnels, demonstrating to the world that they care no more for the lives of Palestinians than they did for the, the Jews they slaughtered. President Clinton once said, 
that leadership is the capacity to look around the corner of history just a little bit. Well, and that is why, perhaps, though the wounds are still open and the pain raw and visceral, it is the work of leaders to remember that it is never too early to begin planning for what comes after. And what comes after should be dedicated to Prime Minister Ben-Gurion's belief that, and I quote, real peace with our Arab neighbors will require a settlement they will not reluctantly agree to live with, but will enthusiastically welcome from their hearts as essential for our common future. That is the only true security for Israel. Then together, we could turn the Middle East into a second Garden of Eden and one of the great creative centers of the entire Earth. Elie Vassell once asked, what have I learned in the last 40 years? Well, I learned the perils of language and those of silence. I learned that in extreme situations where human lives and dignity are at stake, neutrality is a sin. It helps the killers, not the victims. I am far too familiar with the history of my own country to ever be silent or neutral when it comes to the victims of anti-Semitism. Larry Greenspan from Toronto is here tonight, and Charles Bronfman of the great Bronfman dynasty from Montreal, with Rita, are here, here as well. And they know, too, what happened in Canada. Larry Tannenbaum and Judy, yeah. So, sorry, Larry. Sorry. You can tell I'm out of office. Yeah. Yeah. In the spring of 1937, two years after the Nuremberg race laws were enacted, Canada's Prime Minister Mackenzie King visited Germany to meet Chancellor Adolf Hitler, after which he recorded the following in his diary. Quote, my sizing up, but he is really one, Hitler, who truly loves his fellow man. As I talked with him, I could not but think of Joan of Arc. He is distinctly a mystic." Unquote. The following day, King lunched with the Nazi foreign minister, Konstantin von Neurath, who, quote, admitted they had taken some pretty rough steps, but the truth was that the country was going to pieces. The Jews were getting control of all the business, the finance, and it was necessary to get them out to have the Germans really control their own city and affairs. Now, how did Canada's prime minister react to these diabolically racist and extremely ominous concerns by the most powerful leaders of the Third Reich? Quote, Mackenzie King said, I wrote a letter of some length by hand to Van Neurath whom I like exceedingly. He is, if ever there was one, a genuinely kind and good man. King's description of Hitler as a latter-day Joan of Arc and von Neurath as a good man was not the reaction of an ignorant rube duped by sick, slick salesmen of hate. No, Van Neurath's anti-Semitic screed simply validated what he the Prime Minister of Canada already believed. We know that because a few months before his trip to Germany, King revealed himself when he met an elderly Russian immigrant in Canada who related that he had built a furniture and clothing business on Rideau and Bank Streets in Ottawa, had three sons and a daughter, and was now retired. A true Canadian success story. King recorded in his diary, the only unfortunate part is that the Jews, having acquired foothold 
It will not be long before this part of Ottawa will become more or less possessed by them. This from the Prime Minister of Canada, for God's sake. The Prime Minister sets both the agenda and the tone in Ottawa. Is it any wonder that Canada's doors were slammed shut to Jewish immigrants before and during the war? Or that when asked how many Jews would be allowed into Canada, a senior immigration official famously replied, none is too many. Or that a shipload of desperate Jews were denied entry and indeed sailed back to Europe on a voyage of the damned. There come times in a nation's history when the failure to do the right thing has consequences so great that its footfalls haunt us through history. This was such a time, a time when Canada's heritage and promise were dishonored. To this day, I cannot and will not watch footage of the faces of Jewish mothers, fathers and children consigned to the gas chambers without, as a Canadian, feeling a great sense of sorrow, loss, and guilt. I was born in Bay Como, Quebec, a small paper mill town on the north shore of the St. Lawrence River in 1939, a few months before Canada declared war on Hitler's Germany. There were no Jews in Bay Como. It was not until I entered law school at Université Laval in Quebec City in 1960 that I really came to know Jews. I had two Jewish classmates, Michael Kastner and Israel Sunny Mass, one from a wealthy family and one working class like me. We became friends and remain so to this day. I learned about the tiny but impressive Jewish community there, but little of its history and challenges in Canada. It was when I moved to Montreal to practice law in 1964 that I first came into contact with a large Jewish community, which ignited my interest in and support of the Jews in Israel. By this time, the horrors of the Holocaust and the systemic persecution of Jews were fully documented. Why, I asked myself, would such evil be visited upon anyone, and specifically the families of this vibrant community, I was getting to know? The Jews of Montreal were remarkable. Families were close, values were taught, education was revered, work was honored, and success was expected. How could it be, I often wondered, that the progenitors of people demonstrably making such a powerful contribution to the economic, cultural, and political life of Montreal and Canada were reviled over centuries and decimated in a six-year period, beginning in the year of my birth. Thus began my first serious reflections on anti-Semitism. Following the Holocaust, the cry of never again became both affirmation and promise. We hoped that humanity would forswear anti-Semitism forever. The founding of the State of Israel in 1948 reinforced that hope. In 1976, at a Quebec economic summit, chaired by Premier René Lévesque, I was astonished to hear the president of the Quebec Teachers Union denounce Sam Steinberg and other Montreal Jewish leaders in a decidedly racist manner. Although I was only a member of the private sector at the time, I demanded the microphone and denounced him and his views on the spot. That That day, I promised myself that if I were ever in a position of leadership, I would do what I could to lift some of the stain from our national character, left from that time in the 1930s, 
when we abandoned the Jewish people at the very time in their history when they most needed our protection. So in 1984, by then I was leader of the opposition, when the Pierre Trudeau government invited the Palestine Liberation Organization's UN representative to be heard in the Canadian Parliament at a time when the PLO was officially designated as a terrorist organization. I called the Israeli ambassador and told he was in sickbed. I said, I don't give a hell what he is. I want him out of the sickbed now, come to my office in Parliament, and we are both going to denounce and eviscerate the government and the PLO. And he did, and he was good. In 1985, by now Prime Minister, my government appointed the Duchesne Commission of Inquiry on Nazi war criminals who had escaped to Canada. Because, as I said then, our citizenship shall not be dishonored by those who preach hatred, and Canada shall never become a safe haven for such persons. I appointed Jews to my cabinet and to the highest reaches of the public service and judiciary. I appointed three Jews in succession, Stanley Hart, Norman Spector, and Hugh Siegel, as chief of staff, perhaps the most sensitive and influential unelected position in Ottawa. I appointed Norman Spector as Canada's first Jewish ambassador to Israel, smashing the odious myth of dual loyalties that had prevented Jews from serving in that position for 40 years. I invited Chaim Herzog to make the first official state visit to Canada by a president of Israel. On June 27, 1989, I had the high honor of introducing President Herzog as he spoke to a joint session of the House of Commons and the Senate. Senator David Kroll, was an outstanding member of the Jewish community in Ontario, elected to Parliament as a Liberal in 1945. I was a Conservative. He never made cabinet for no apparent reason other than he was a Jew. Everybody knew that. I elevated this remarkable Canadian to the Privy Council on his 90th birthday. As leader of the opposition, I articulated my view of Canada's foreign policy in the Middle East. It was at a dinner that Charles Bronfman chaired in Montreal. I said that under my government, we would treat fairly with the moderate nations in the region, such as Jordan. But that first and foremost, Canada would make an unshakable commitment to the integrity and well-being of Israel. And for my nine years as Prime Minister of Canada, we did precisely that. We committed Canada to participate in the Gulf War in 1991. The many reasons included the security of Israel. History will record that we did the right thing. In 1993, I was the first foreign leader invited to meet with President Clinton. At a joint news conference, we were asked about the peace process. I said, I'm always very concerned when people start to lecture Israel on the manner in which it looks after its own internal security, because for very important historical reasons, Israel is, of course, best qualified to make determinations about its own well-being. I believe that to be true as well today. This doesn't mean that Israel should be immune from criticism. One can strongly disagree with policies of the government of Israel without being called an anti-Semite. Nor does it mean that a strong defense of Israel's right to security precludes the acceptance of a Palestinian state whose citizens can know, as they do in Israel, the benefits of health care, education, economic opportunities, and growing prosperity. This should be the objective of all who believe in justice 
and the dignity of mankind. The rise in attacks on Jews and Jewish institutions around the world testify to the intractability of the problem and to the constant need for vigilance, consistency, and strength in dealing with the entire sweep of anti-Semitism. But this latest surge of anti-Semitism did not suddenly surface out of nowhere. It is part of the historical continuum that was only briefly interrupted following the Second World War. In the wake of the Holocaust that killed two out of every three European Jews, a butcher's bill so obscene that even now, more than 80 years later, it beggars understanding, firewalls were thrown up and the bonfires of anti-Semitism were for a time reduced to flickering embers. But those firewalls, weakened by the passage of time and willful neglect, have been breached. Cloaked in the armor of free speech, fueled by hate, and stoked by the oxygen of the internet and social media, those fires now burn out of control. A telling example of that neglect is that according to a recent study, 22% of young Canadians haven't heard about the Holocaust. 49% couldn't name a concentration camp. 54% were unaware that 6 million Jews were killed during the Holocaust. Holocaust, And 57 said that people really don't care about the Holocaust anymore. No child comes into this world a hater. Hatred is learned. Therein lies both the problem and the solution. Education, education, education. As my friend Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. Our children must be taught why this soul-devouring virus cannot be countenanced and why it must be eradicated. And recent studies report that 93% of Americans and 85% of Canadians agree with this. That support only counts if it can be translated into action. Indeed, the government of Ontario, in which my daughter Caroline is a cabinet minister, introduced mandatory Holocaust education to its grade six curriculum at the start of this school year to match an existing requirement in the grade 10 Canadian history curriculum. I urge every school board in every school district in Canada and the United States to copy that example. With strong leadership, this proposal is eminently, eminently doable and we get the chance to begin the eradication of anti-Semitism across the country. The governments of Canada and the United States and others have and continue to develop policies and programs to tackle anti-Semitism. These are all necessary and overdue and all to the good. However, to relegate anti-Semitism to the realm of public policy and to count solely on government to deal with the, this social cancer does a grave disservice to the victims behind the faces and the mysterious statistics of hate. It would be a mistake to believe that government action absolves us of our ob obligation to our fellow citizens. Indeed, it is more than an obligation. It's a moral imperative one best described by Henry Melville, the canon of St. Paul's Cathedral, who two centuries ago wrote, ye cannot live only for yourselves. A thousand fires connect you with your fellow men, and among those fires and fibers, as along sympathetic threads, run your actions as causes 
and return to you as effects. Canadians and Americans share an incontrovertible truth. We are all children of immigrants. We have been ennobled and enriched by every culture and religion that thrives in the rich soil of our freedom. We derive our strength and our energy from our di diversity. And while Jews may remain separate from others in the specifics of their faith, they are joined intimately with all of us in their pride of citizenship, their love of peace, and their appreciation for what jewels we have in these civilized and mature nations, Canada and the United States. Like any gem, we at times show a rough edge, but stand out as beacons of freedom when held up to the light of human experience. We are home for millions who have sought sanctuary and a fresh beginning far removed from the savage winds of violence which afflict so many parts of the world. There is no word in the English language more comforting and more welcoming than home. More than a place, it conjures up the primal human need for sanctuary and acceptance. And more than anything else, the word home evokes a sense of belonging. In the final analysis, Jews are our fellow citizens. They are our friends. They are our neighbors. And this is their home. But until we feel safe and accepted by everyone, it will never, in any complete sense, be home for us all. I have, in what seems no more than a blink of an eye, gone from a young to an old man. I know that in the Old Testament, it says that young men have visions and old men dream dreams. Well, in my dreams, anti-Semitism is no more. It will require the vision and the leadership of the young to make that dream come true. It won't be easy, but leadership, that innate, indelible mark of character, steeped in integrity, courage and conviction, and underscored by the moral imperative to do the right thing, never relents and never retreats when faced with great difficulty or uncertain success. Life, as I found out, is an unending series of challenges from which no one emerges unscathed. I can remember the accomplishments and the setbacks. I can remember the view from the highest mountaintop and the sorrow one feels in the valley of defeat. Defeat is not something to fear, but surrender is something to reject. Anti-Semitism, born in ignorance and nurtured in envy, is the stepchild of delusion and evil and is a scourge that must, absolutely must, be eradicated. It may not be stamped out in my lifetime, nor in the lifetime of my children, or even sadly, those of my grandchildren. But as Reinhold Niebuhr reminded us, nothing worth doing is completed in our lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. And nothing fine or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. And therefore, we must be saved by faith. I urge you all to keep the faith in the trying days to come.